You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jeffrey Beaver. Well, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show for you. Go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. Any way that you download podcasts, you can listen to it there. I'd like to talk about some sponsors before we get started. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experience. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques, learn from a vast collection of free writing resources, make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers, Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.com. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've ever seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into that routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach those word count goals. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, Research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words. Stay for the fun. It's ForTheWords.com. That's the number four, TheWords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity, but it can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat-in-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal, like spending less than one hour per day on email, to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours a day on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off our Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories let us help you rescue your time well thanks for joining me again for the author stories podcast where i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers today i'm really excited to have jeffrey deaver on the show with me his brand new book is called the never game and when you're hearing this it is out everywhere in hardback and audiobook and kindle or ebook edition wherever you buy your books it is available now uh, jeff welcome to the show well, thank you, Hank. A pleasure to talk to you. I'm excited to have you on the show. I've been a longtime fan, and uh, when when I saw your new book releasing, uh, I just knew that we had to get you on the show to talk about it. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, though, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, I remember it quite uh, vividly. I was um, 11 years old. And reading um, my uh, father's James Bond novel, I I, I have to be honest, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, I think it was uh, I think it was Dr. No, which I think was Fleming's first Bond novel. Um, And um, it might have been from Russia with love. But in in any event, uh, it was 1961. One of the 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 Bond novels in paperback, a little signet paperback cost 25 cents. And I was in love with the idea of story. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. And I wrote a, um, I called it a novel. It was of course a, a short story, but I divided it into two chapters. So chapter one, chapter two, and I wrote the end at the end and I did the cover art myself. 
it, and I was, I'm not an artist at all, but I have to say the art still was better than the book that I wrote or the little short story I wrote, which was about a, a spy, believe it or not. And uh, he, he was, I know he was like, he, he, he parachuted into Russia to steal uh, a, a super airplane at the time. That was, of course, the height of the Cold War. And so we had to steal the Russian, uh, the Soviet airplanes. And uh, it was terrible. And thank goodness it doesn't <laughs> exist because, you know, when you, you achieve a certain level of success, your publisher wants you to, you know, dredge up that that early work. But thank goodness that it's, it's gone. And even if I found it, I would I would shred it. But, but I knew then I wanted to be a, a writer. And uh, my, my life is a full-time writer of fiction. And my life has been a, a journey to do that. I also knew that you cannot be a prodigy writer, even at a young age, you, you can't make a living. Well, I shouldn't say can't, there are exceptions, but, but generally you have to live a while. You have to live life to experience things. And so I had other jobs. I was a journalist and attorney, a singer, a songwriter for a little while. But um, basically my goal always was to get back to that, that magic moment of being absorbed in stories and in my case learning to tell them wow i had an aunt who was a voracious reader and she collected paperbacks all through uh the 60s 70s 80s and passed down boxes of of paperbacks to me and some of those were those ian fleming novels and uh i I had a similar experience there was um you say what you want to about the books they they just they had this magical quality of just sucking you into the story um that's that's awesome i love that and they were lean books too they were not that uh, you know they, they were like 160 pages and and for the time you think uh, your listeners may be thinking what an 11 year old boy reading the james bond books they were very tame that was the era when there were no bad words uh, you know, the bedroom scenes that we cut away before we saw anything, there was very little, actually very little violence in them. Uh, so they were actually quite appropriate uh, for uh, uh, for people my age, but uh, they were magical. They were. They were. <laughs> so you, you go out to collect life experience knowing that you want to come back um, one day. What, what was that... Uh, that turnabout for you? Um, what was it that brought you back to writing and how did you know that you were ready? It was, to be honest with you, a, um, a practical matter. I have never liked the idea of being a starving artist. I, um, have, as I say, I had jobs to support me. Uh, I wanted not luxuries in life by any means, but I wanted to be sure I could pay my bills uh, be responsible. <clears throat> and I also found that, um, you know, when you, you have to struggle, your creativity suffers. Uh, this idea of the um, uh, artist in the garret, you know, the f freezing and starving up in the uh, the attic and, uh, you know, drinking and doing drugs and things. I, you know, we have a responsibility to our, our audience. We need to make sure we write a, a book or, you know, paint a painting or whatever you're particular favorite form of art is we have to make sure we do that as best we can we we you know get paid we writers get paid to make up stories for a living it's just the best thing in the world and so i wanted to make sure that i um uh you know i had my creature comforts taken care of again nothing luxurious but um uh once that was uh settled i was actually working as an attorney in manhattan and uh writing on my commute and I started to sell books. And at some point, my income for the books was pretty close to what I was making as an attorney. Now, I had, by that time, to get more hours to write, because working as an attorney in Manhattan takes many, many hours. I was working as a legal editor. I'd left my law practice to do that. So I was only working eight hours a day and writing the rest of the time. But my income from the books just about equaled my income from the law. And I said, I uh, took a deep breath and said, uh, okay, let's, let's take the leap. And, uh, I did and never looked back. That was actually 30 years ago, uh, uh, this year. Wow. So what was that first book? Well, the first book now that, again, that was before I left the, uh, law practice. I, I published six before, um, okay. I, I, I quit. And it was a, uh, I don't know. Let me think of what, what would a, a literary critic say? Maybe the worst book written that decade. Uh, I, 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 maybe there's a, a, a finer way to put that, but it was a book called Voodoo. And it was my one stab at the occult because I, I love Stephen King's writing. I mean, no one 
it, it, no one is Stephen King. Sure. Uh, that's a truism, of course. But by that, I mean, he sits down with an idea and you know, I don't know how many months later, out comes a lengthy, beautifully crafted book. Sure. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, I read his, all of his, almost all of his writing. I thought horror, I, I'm, I'm not, wasn't really, aside from him, not really a big horror fan, but I thought I'd give it a shot. And, um, this is before The Walking Dead, before all the uh, uh, the uh, what are they the vampire books and so forth. Well, I mean, we had Vampire Lestat. I think we had uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, of course. But but I thought I'll give it a shot. Nobody had ever done anything about the um, Santeria, uh, the voodoo, uh, the hoodoo, uh, the Caribbean religion with the occult side. So I I, I gave it a shot, and. Uh, it uh, let's say it didn't didn't do particularly well, and it, when I went back and reread it, it was not well well crafted at all. Um, but there is something an interesting phenomenon about the book world that you and maybe some of your listeners know that um, first edition books can be worth quite a bit, and it, it, the first edition element it means the the first uh, printing, not a revision, but the first printing, and. The books like, you know, um, what am I thinking of? Like uh, Tale of Two Cities or um, um, a, a book by, by Charles Dickens, first edition, actually may not be worth a huge amount of money as opposed to a very popular author. For instance, a first edition of J.K. Rowling's first Harry Potter is worth a huge amount of money. Now, whereas the first edition of Bleak House may not be worth that much. And it all has to do with the market. It doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with the nature of the book itself. Well, that's a long story. But here's the bottom line: my first book was so bad, nobody bought it. The publisher <laughs> shipped me three or four cartons of these books, and uh, I still still have them. And I looked on eBay not too long ago, and because they were so rare, uh, had nothing to do with the quality. They're worth like five or six hundred dollars each. So I, I may not be a very good investor in the stock market. I may not make a you know a huge. <laughs> I may not make millions with the books, but I at least am able to retire on my first very bad book. Well, and and you have something to leave your loved ones uh, that that'll keep growing in value. <laughs> As long as they sell it, I love them too exactly. much to let them read the stupid <laughs> book. But uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That is so funny, um, Jeffrey. You have written more than thirty books uh, in your career. Um, uh, many mysteries and thrillers. Um, the uh, do, do you do you hearken back to those Ian Fleming novels when you write? Do you get that feeling um, of of adventure and of 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 wanting to pull people into a story the way you were pulled into a story. It's so important to craft a book that creates a roller coaster for the reader. Uh, Mickey Spillane, who was a uh, writer of uh, we, we we call it pulp fiction. I'm not talking about the the movie. I'm talking about the phenomenon of pulp fiction, which was uh, paperbacks, primarily paperback originals written in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s about uh, kind of gritty uh, private eyes, you know, dames and guys and involved in shady dealings and and so forth, tough cops. Uh, but Mickey Spillane, who wrote many many books, a great writer, he said, you know, people don't buy a book to get to the middle. Right. They buy a book to get to the end. And it's our job as authors to grab the readers by the lapels in the opening scene and not let go until the very last scene. Uh, if somebody buys one of my books and they say, oh, Jeff, I, I liked it. It was a pretty good book. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I spent all summer reading it. Uh, I failed. I, I want my readers to pick up a book and have to finish it, if not that day within a couple of days. And if I'm not doing that, uh, I'm doing something wrong. So I, uh, in a very calculated way, think very hard about what is going to get people to turn pages. And I've developed a formula for writing books, which we can you know, chat about later if you like, um, that, that really keys into that goal of mine, that I don't want to write an interesting book. I want to write a, oh my gosh, my palms are sweating. What is going to happen next book? And uh, I have uh, people like Ian Fleming, as well as, um, you know, other uh, other authors that I, I loved growing up, people like Dashiell Hammett and uh, some of the um, uh, non-crime writers as well. Uh, people like Ray Bradbury in science fiction and Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote Tarzan and other series. Those were 
uh, books that just they were about story. They weren't about uh, selling an agenda. They weren't about politics. They just moved the story along so that that could, you know, take us out of our daily cares and uh, give us a, a couple hours or maybe a day's worth of just of just pure fun and and tense relaxation, a roller coaster, in other words. Well, tell us a little bit about that formula. How how do you approach book writing that is uh, <clears throat> is guaranteed to keep us on that roller coaster? This has taken me some years to figure out. My first books didn't sell particularly well, and then I uh, got the idea that uh, you know I I was at the time an attorney. Well. When you approach a case as an attorney or approach a business deal, uh, it doesn't have to be litigation, you, you plan everything out ahead of time, every single thing. Despite what we see in the movies and, t- and TV, when the lawyers go into court, there are hardly ever any surprises. They know the answers to all the questions. And if they don't, they're not doing, they're not doing a very good job as an attorney. So I thought, why should I be any different In writing a book, why should I not take my job any less seriously than an attorney takes her job or a brain surgeon takes his job? And so I I, I decided to start outlining now the before I wrote the book. Now, the the world of writing is divided into two categories. Those who uh, who outline, they're called the plotters and those who don't, who just sit down and let the book go where it will. And those who call it the pantsers, as in seat of the pants. Well, I'm not a I'm not a pantser, and God bless any author who can do that. George R. R. Martin, the writer of uh, the Game of Thrones books, uh, does not outline. Uh, I, well, I've heard him say that, and I, I you know certainly certainly believe him. Uh, and obviously, you know he's a very successful uh, author. Uh, Lee Child, a friend of mine, he does not outline the Jack Reacher books. Uh, again, very successful. I just don't quite work that way. I need to get everything plotted out ahead of time. And also, you know, my books do take place over a short period of time. There are three subplots going on at once, and I like my surprise endings. So I spend eight months getting all of the, I I call it a schematic, getting the schematic of the book done with all of those plots outlined on a big chart. I write write in where all the clues are. I know where every character uh, walks onto the stage, you might say, and when he or she leaves the stage, often vertically, sometimes horizontally, because not everybody survives the ending of my <laughs> books, of course. And uh, when the outline is done in the Never Game, for instance, my outline was about 150 pages long, and it had every element of the book in it. And I, 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 during that eight months when I'm doing the outline, I do the research too, uh, get all the facts at my hand. And then at the uh, um, when that's all finished, I sit down and I can write the book very quickly because I know where it's going to go. Uh, we hear about the concept of writer's block. Uh, I, I don't think there is writer's block. I think if you're blocked, and I mean completely blocked, not, you know, I don't know what, how to get the characters into the car today that, you know, little technical things like that. But I mean, if you're, you you look at the middle of a book and you have no idea where you're going to go, there's a reason for that. And you should frankly just throw it out and start something else. Well, the, once the outline's done, I've worked through all that. I know where the story is going to go or... Uh, in some cases, I look at the outline and the outline isn't going to go anywhere. I see that that block in the middle of the outline and I throw out 20 or 30 pages, which is a lot easier than throwing out 400 pages of, of prose that you've written. But anyway, once that's done, I don't have any blocks. I sit down, write the book in any order I want, and out it comes in about two months. And then there's a lot of revision and polishing that goes into it. So that's basically my uh, my template for writing a book. That is fantastic. Um, and, and spending that amount of time in the pre-writing uh, probably makes you super familiar with the story, almost like you're a character in the story, I'll bet. <laughs> that's a good point. I never heard it put that way, but that's that's true. Um, I, um, uh, I Well, not, now that you, you mentioned that, I'll, I'll share one uh, another aspect of my technique. I, uh, I, I was a journalist a long time ago, and I learned to touch type. And I, when I write the book, I look at my outline and I see, okay, here's a scene where Coulter Shaw has to go to a, a video gaming convention because the Never Game is set in the world of video games. And um, I say, okay, and I look at my research and I have that all, all in my head. And then I shut the lights out or close my eyes and I, I, I just imagine myself being there with him and I, I type. I don't look at the screen. 
Um, you know, I, I make mistakes certainly, but we, I go back and, and correct that. Um, and uh, so I, I, you know, I, I envision it and I hear the characters talking. You know, we authors are are allowed to hear voices in our head. There's nothing wrong right. with that. That's the, that's the, you know, it's not a sign of mental illness. I'm not speaking for all authors, but generally that's the rule. And so um, uh, I, I found that uh, I, I do really become part of the, uh, the story. In fact, I was just at a, a conference not too long ago and um, somebody asked, uh, how do you, you know, dwell with the darkness and uh, I say, well, you know, the fact is the books look kind of sick and twisted and I do get involved in the story. But at, at the end of the day, five o'clock or six o'clock when it's time to knock off, knock off work, I pretty much put the bad guys away and just go upstairs and have a beer. I, I, I don't have to you know, sit in, in, a, in, a, in a corner uh, hugging myself saying, Jeffrey, it's going to be OK. They're not real people. I, I'm, at this stage, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty able to separate the two. Uh, I love that. Um, about 20 years ago, you wrote a book, uh, The Bone Collector, which introduced us to a new character, Lincoln Rhyme. Um, that book uh, spun into a massively successful series, and that first book was made into a movie starring Denzel Washington. Um, a, a, amazing work. Uh, after writing that series for so long, I would imagine that you get very familiar with those characters. And it. Uh, I, I, I won't say that that it probably gets easier as you go, but there are certain aspects of the storytelling that are inherently built in because you've already got fully uh, alive, fleshed out characters. Um, shall we oh, say? Oh, yes. No, it, it's certainly, yeah, it, it, you're absolutely right. No, it, it is easier, certainly easier. Uh, you don't have to uh, reinvent things uh, over and over again. Uh, the um, For your uh, listeners who may not be familiar with the, the Bone Collector, that was the movie starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. And and it's about uh, my hero, Lincoln Rhyme, is a um, uh, quadriplegic forensic detective. He worked for the NYPD and was injured on the job. And he, he's, of course, under medical uh, retirement. But he, he comes back to uh, become a consulting detective just like Sherlock Holmes was. Uh, the books are set in the present day, of course, but uh, you know, like Sherlock Holmes did for the for Scotland Yard, and uh, <clears throat> I, um, I I know that character uh, very 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 well. I know Amelia Sachs, who was played by Angelina in the um, in the movie. Um, the, the, there are both good sides and, and, and bad sides about that. Uh, the good side is you don't have to reinvent them once again, right. but the uh, bad side is that you better check your facts just to be sure, because you can't <laughs> yes. have, um, uh, you can't have, uh, say, um, this, this hasn't happened, but I, uh, you know, I'd say that, you know, Amelia picked up her Glock in her left hand because the readers would say, no, no, she's right-handed. How could you have her do, have her do that? So you do have to be a little bit careful, but, but I, you know, I've been, uh, I, I have to say, I, I've been very uh, pleased with the popularity of the movie because it's, it's gotten people interested in the, um, in the book, and you know, to be honest, uh, I've been active with the disabled community because he's a, a quadriplegic. Uh, it's a severe disability, but he's also a hero. And I don't sugarcoat him. I don't put him up on a pedestal. He's a curmudgeon. He, right. he gets really angry about his condition, uh, and yet he says, "This is the way I am." You know, okay, you may. Um, he points to another character. He said, you know, you may have your issues about your physical inclination. Maybe you, you'd like to lose some weight, but you, you've got your body. I have my body. Our job is to, in his, in his case, to solve crimes. And um, uh, people really respond to that. In fact, uh, I, I, we just learned last week that NBC is now picked up uh, a Bone Collector series. Uh, the title is going to be Lincoln because it's based not on the just on the Bone Collector book, but of um, the 11 books in the series. And that's going to, uh, uh, the series will air uh, first season this year, uh, later this year on uh, NBC. So we're very excited about that. But we, we can see that this character is someone that uh, readers and viewers really respond to because of his heroism. And the fact is that, you know, we we do get a little tired, I have to say, of these superhero uh, characters, and I don't mean necessarily the Marvel superhero characters, but the the thriller action adventure heroes who can do no wrong, who can leap tall buildings, who can shoot straighter than anybody else. And Lincoln Rhyme is a um, is, is an intellectual hero. He uses his mind as his weapon, and I think people have enjoyed that. 
Which brings me to Coulter Shaw, your uh, protagonist in the Never Game. Um, this first off, this is a new series, so you you wipe the slate clean, and all of the things that you have built and and put together for the Bone Collector series, all that's off the table, and you you're creating an entirely new world with a new protagonist, um, who also is not he's not a perfect guy, he's not that uh, it, it, he's not the the Jack Reacher, if, if you will, to 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 borrow from uh, Leech Out, who we were talking about earlier, who. Um, you know, you always know that uh, what's going to come out of Reacher, um, but but Coulter is a different kind of guy and in a different situation altogether. What was the uh, what was the inspiration for this book? Many years ago, I wrote a, a series, a three book series uh, featuring a fellow named John Pelham, and he was a uh, location scout uh, for a film company. It, he traveled around the country <clears throat> to look for uh, spots to shoot films. And um, he was an amateur private eye who would, you know, come into town and it'd be a crime and he'd get involved in it. You never wanted to be John Pelham's sidekick, you know, in a Tom Hanks movie. You don't want to be the, the, his buddy because we know what's going to happen in the first, the opening scene. The buddy gets killed, of course. His right. wingman gets killed. So, um, uh, and, and then John Pelham would solve the crime. Well, those were, were murder mysteries. They weren't thrillers. They were slow moving uh they were they were popular they they were nominated for some awards but um the the, uh the the books being set in hollywood hollywood is kind of a you know to be honest it's a goofy it's a goofy place um the the, we kind of make fun of uh fun of the the players as in the player the movie and the book if you're familiar with that there was uh get shorty both the movie and tv show so uh it's it's kind of easy to laugh at hollywood so that series i didn't want to pursue but i always had it in the back of my mind i want an itinerant uh hero i want somebody who can uh come to town uh with the intent of solving a crime solving the crime and then leaving, but not being a cop. I don't want them to do police procedurals. So somehow I heard about the idea of a reward being offered by either the police or uh, by um, private individuals for maybe a missing person, uh, for a, an escaped convict, uh, a terrorist that no one can find. And so I created a hero, a Coulter Shaw, who travels around the country in his Winnebago to look for these rewards. Now, it, it's not, he makes his living that way, but it's not really about the money. And in fact, in some, some of the stories, he, he doesn't even take the reward or he takes it and he gives it away uh, to a good cause. What he likes about the reward is that it means there's a problem that no one has been able to solve. Uh, because if they could, there wouldn't be the reward. And that means it stymied the police and maybe stymied uh, a family who's, um, uh, daughter has gone missing, his son has gone missing, and the police aren't um, as uh, involved as they should be in finding that person. And so Shaw is a self-described restless man. He he needs something to engage him all the time. And so he travels around the, uh, the country and uh, pursues these uh, rewards. Uh, in the Never Game, the first in the series, he goes out to Silicon Valley to look for a young woman who's been uh, abducted, uh, it appears, by someone obsessed with a, a video game and is acting out that video game in real life. Now, this is a video game I made up, um, and, and it, it involves a, um, a, a, a villain in the, the game who uh, basically kidnaps somebody and uh, hides them in an abandoned location and then gives them five objects, and they need to use those five objects to uh, kind of MacGyver-like escape, and if they don't, the the bad guy comes back and uh, comes back to to kill them, and so it's a race against time. Like all of my books, Coulter has to figure out uh, how to play the game basically and uh, track down the villain uh, before he strikes again. How how did you prepare yourself to write uh, about this world of online gaming and this um, kind of a fantasy world inside of the fantasy world you created? I'm not a, a gamer person. I remember um, some games. Uh, I think I had Pong back in the 70s, which was a ball bouncing back and forth. And, uh, I, you know, I guess I tried my hand at Pac-Man and I uh, uh, can't even think of some of the others back in the 70s and early 80s. But <clears throat> a few years ago, I was playing um, a, a video game 
with my niece and I'd, I'd never seen it before. She said, uh, Uncle Jeff, this is uh, Minecraft. Uh, let's play. And I said, oh, okay, sure. How do you play? And she said, well, here, you load it on your phone and I've got it on my phone and we were connected via Wi-Fi or whatever it was, whatever system it was. And uh, I said, how do we play? And she said like this. And then she pulled out a sword. Her character pulled out a sword and stabbed me to death uh, in the first, <laughs> you know, the first like 10 seconds. I thought it was a bit unsporting because I'd never yeah. played. And she, of course, yeah. being a nine-year-old, played these games all the time. And I, I laughed, of course. And then, you know, she told me what to do. And we, we had some fun playing the game. But basically, I was so happy that happened because it, I, I thought, well, what an idea. Uh, somebody takes the video game and uh, gets um, a little obsessed with it, as I learned people do, and um, takes it into the, the real world. And so I did a lot of research into video games and was astonished to find that it's an industry bigger than Hollywood. Uh, in America, 200 million people play, so two-thirds of our population play video games regularly. Uh, they, they play on computer, but smartphones, now the, the biggest growing platform, and if you uh, walk, I, I sometimes, on an airplane, I fly, you know, 100,000 miles a year. I, uh, I'm booked to a, and research things. So I, I always go to the restroom in the back, even if I don't need to, so I can see what people are doing, hoping they read books. And many people are reading books, but many people are playing uh, video games. And it's uh, it, it was really quite eye-opening to me to see them uh, staring down at the little screens and playing. Some are, uh, you know, just kind of the mindless time-wasting games. Some are um, uh, games that uh, where you learn skills. Uh, some are, uh, you know, combat-oriented games. And um, so I thought, well, uh, this is something I just have to uh, have to write a book about. And so Colter Shaw gets a bit of an education in the the gaming world, too. Well, the book is The Never Game. It is absolutely fantastic, Jeffrey. Uh, you have uh, outdone yourself again. Um, if people are just learning about you and, and all of the work that you've done, is there a place where they can connect with you online to dig into your back catalog and follow along with news coming up? Oh, you bet. Uh, JeffreyDeaver.com is my website, and I have a very active Facebook and Twitter presence, uh, Jeffrey Deaver on Facebook and at Jeffrey Deaver on uh, on Twitter. And um, I look forward to uh, maybe uh, visiting some of your uh, visiting in person with some of your listeners at my uh, my book event. So please check out that schedule and uh, come by and say hi. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. We're going to send everybody to see you and to pick up their copy of The Never Game. Thank you, Hank. A real pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Didn't your dad teach you not to trespass? Yeah. Sorry, I'll go. Joey stepped forward, but Hedwick remained motionless, blocking the only exit. No, 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 no. Someone needs to learn a lesson about respecting other people's property. Joey felt unnerved and panicky. Please, Hedwick, Mr. Van Brunt. Please, Mr. Van Brunt, may I go now? Please? Not such a smartass now, are you? His voice grew flat and contemptuous. You little bastards think you run the world. But you have no idea. No idea where your food comes from, what your parents have to go through to put clothes on your back. Humiliating jobs, long hours, going gray, to provide for you. What are you talking about? Life. Real life. You think it's easy, don't you? Don't you? Those stupid adults doing their stupid adult things while you play all day. Well, it's hard. You hear me? It's hard. Joey's breath caught. He knew what Hedwick was capable of. What did you do to Jason? Nothing. Where is he then? Jason's run away from home. I don't believe you. I don't care what you believe. I'm the adult. I ask the questions. What did you do to my son? To Zef? Is Zef okay? No. He's not. Zeph is not okay. And it was you, wasn't it? You're the one who did it. 
Who did what? Who twisted his mind. I haven't done anything to Zeph. Don't lie to me! Hedwig raised a hand, and a fireball blossomed there. Joey had never seen Hedwig's gift before. The man held a piece of hell. His face looked like something carved from driftwood, full of cracks and crevices. His eyes were shadowed and vacant, but glittering with flame, like knot holes full of fireflies. Yeah, someone's mind had twisted, but not Zeph's. Hedwig's gone batshit. Hedwig passed the fireball from one hand to the other. Did Zef send you for his things? I know you know where he is. He said... He said he was in love with you. Hedwig made it sound as if Zef had confessed to murder. Is that true? I don't know. Hedwig broke into a wide grin. Well, we can find out, can't we? He's a pension, right? A pension would know. Know what? You're not making sense. It's their gift. The pension gift? My son's a pension, like his whore of a mother. And pensions are telepaths. They always know when the people they love are in danger. Joey's eyes had gone wide. He blinked, trying to process the information. Zeph had a gift? For sure? They have a psychic alarm. If you hurt someone they love, they come running. He raised the fireball. So let's find out. Let's find out if Zev really loves you. Let's see if he's a fag or not. I know he's not. You'll see. He won't feel a thing when I do it. When you do what? When I burn you black. Joey went cold. Hedwig meant it.